I'm going to transition this to to Jason Valland, who is from uh, from Salesforce. And you know, when I was working with Salesforce, I was saying, "Hey, you know, you guys do so many things around engagement and experience." And I needed someone from Salesforce to come and talk about the strategies, not talk about the product. And 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 they just acquired Slack, which I'm a huge believer. Uh, my my firm is is a huge Slack user. I believe Slack could be a a real powerful tool for universities and college. And this is not a, a sell for Salesforce. I'm saying we have to start thinking about channel communication and so forth. And I know Jason isn't here to talk about that, but I asked Salesforce, you know, who can come and talk about the strategies that universities and colleges can think about? And Jason came up. And so Jason has been uh, kind enough to give us his time to talk about the experiences and, and so forth. So Jason, if you want to start sharing your screen and- And Matt, I'm actually having a screen sharing issue here. For no some problem. Reason. We, will, we will take that over then. Awesome. Okay. Sorry about that. Yeah, no <laughs> worries. I will guide I'm... you in terms of what's, where, to, where to start here. Yeah, no <laughs> problem. So Jason, why don't you just quickly just, you know, give a little bit of your, your, your talk and I'm going to move myself into your screen. And awesome. There. Thank you. I appreciate that, Matt. Thank you. And thank you for inviting me to be here with you today. I'm, I'm very excited to, uh, first of all, hear the presentation that just came before mine. It gave me a lot of great ideas and I think uh, a lot of alignment in terms of, of what we're thinking about. Um, I, I'm very excited to be here today. You know, and I'll, maybe I'll step back for a minute before diving into the presentation. And, and thanks, Matt, for, for sharing this. It, it's I think we are at this incredible moment in higher education right now. I'm very grateful for this moment that we are in today in higher education. I've been working in higher ed uh, for uh, at colleges and universities for about 15 years. I've been at Salesforce for six years. I think you know every moment, that every day I wake up, I'm inspired by uh, the, our industry, by the customers that I'm working with every day, the customers I get to talk to every day. And really over the last year, I've seen, like I never have before, customers really leaning into their values, really leaning into their missions and thinking about how can we, how might we do the thing we've been talking about for a while? How might we re-engineer a process, rethink uh, how we engage with our students and really get clear about why are we here? What is our why as an institution? And beyond that, how do we then take action on that? And I've seen so many customers really start their day uh, in the right way, which is with the customer at the center, with the student at the center, and thinking about how do we build relationships with those students uh, in a different way than we ever have before. As Salesforce, we everything we do is based on a set of four values, trust, customer success, innovation, and equity. I think those values really ring true for a lot of us working in higher ed who are invested in customer success or student success, but know that to get there, we need to build trust uh, as a number one value. And that means building trust at every interaction with a student, but also with faculty and with staff. And so I wanna start actually my presentation with a customer quote, and frankly, not, not a customer, from, from a student actually. This is a, a, a quote from a student at Arizona State University. They're an amazing in innovator in the space. We all know them. I share their story, not to single them out. I think they're actually um, reflective of the innovation that's happening with so many colleges and universities. But I did want to call something out. They were celebrating uh, last year great achievements, great milestones in terms of records they were setting in terms of uh, uh, enrollment and admissions. And they quoted some students. They asked students, okay, well, why did you, great, we hit, we're, we're excited, we're here, why did you choose ASU? And they pulled this quote into a blog that they have on their website. You can, you can check it out. And she says, I, you know, she's coming from, she's coming from California. So she's coming from out of state. She's taking on some risk, right? As many students are, they're deciding between work and coming to school. They're think, making family decisions or what, what's going to be the best investment of my dollar or a loan I may need to take out, right? So she said, I feel like I was wanted at ASU. I'm going to be cared for here. I'm going to have access to the resources I need. And this is before she stepped foot on campus. So she's already feeling this in the beginning. And what's exciting to me about that is ASU and so many other schools have said, it's not enough to say student success or sense of belonging. 
starts at the time a student shows up and then we're going to surround them. They're going to connect and they're going to feel like they're engaged. That's, we need to do that. Yes. But it actually starts on Instagram or Facebook or somewhere else that is a property we don't own. And we've engaged with them in a way that resonates and then taking them on this journey to make them help them feel safe, help them feel connected. We personally care about you. We are going to support you along your way and build a trusted relationship that of course gets you through enrollment to show up on day one and, and yield management. And then, we'll, but also we'll get you to the finish line and actually pivot ASU and pivot us as, as an industry from saying we are about a four year degree, a moment in time to saying we are about relationships and building relationships over the course of a lifetime. I think this is super important to think about how we can build these relationships early, right? How do we kind of create trust and acknowledge the human on the other side of these conversations and that they are looking to make a connection. They may be looking for, you know, I talked with a customer the other day who talked about, you know, and to the point was made earlier by Eric, career services doesn't start, you know, the last, the last semester of the year. Career services doesn't even start actually on day one. It starts in the admissions process. And how do we help that individual who may not have ever thought about a career? They have, may have only thought about a job. How do we help them think about that and connect to a dream very early in the process and start building uh, a lifelong relationship? This, this kind of experience is happening every day right now. And it's because of us as an industry really stepping up and I think thinking in new ways about our mission, about why we're here and how we can use technology and use, frankly, our ideas and our creativity to engage with learners who need our support today more than ever. And if we scroll, Matt, to the next uh, visual here, we did some research recently. We talked to uh, students, faculty, staff uh, around, around the globe, and, and we did find great, as, as you might imagine, really strong data to talk about you know, sense of belonging and students, and particularly in the enrollment in the enrollment funnel. So, seventy-eight percent of students talked about the feeling of belonging influencing their decision to enroll. Right. So, students are thinking about not just the degree, not just whatever other thing that may be happening, but does this make sense for me as an individual? Will I fit in here? And particularly right now, where we are not, we are having a lot of virtual engagement it is more important than ever and sometimes harder than ever to create a sense of belonging through digital channels, but more crucial than ever. And one thing that is exciting, but also a, a challenge is on the other side of this, and that is 65% of staff report that it is hard to get the data that they need to help students. So the, the challenging part about that is that 65% of staff are saying it's hard to get the data they need. And, and so how do we solve that and make that easier? But the exciting piece about that, I think, is that there is very clearly a, a, a desire by staff to think about why we are here, a desire by staff to say, I want to help these students and families, and I want to spend my time doing that work and not doing the work of searching for data and trying to understand what's happening uh, with our students. A, a customer of ours at UNC Charlotte said to me the other day, it's not enough actually for me and my staff to know our students. We need to show them that we know them very clearly. And so we need that data and then we need the tools to take action upon that. Another customer recently talked about their staff and how committed they are to the mission and said to me, you know, we are, um, we are very blessed because we have staff who just love this institution. They are, they love how we serve our community. They are excited about what we do here. So they show up every day, they wake up every morning thinking about what is ahead of us and how I'm gonna connect students to opportunities and how you know, I'm driving a mission here, making a difference in the world and the community. And then they get to work <laughs> and by about lunchtime, they are on a path toward apathy essentially because they can't find the data. It's hard to do this work. It's hard to understand that student. They're spending a lot of time sorting through uh, basic information that they're gonna need to actually do the thing they woke up in the morning wanting to do. The good news is this is a very solvable problem when we take a different approach to thinking about how do we actually empower 
faculty, staff, and students to connect with one another to actually start driving an impact. We know that this is a discussion we've been having for a long time, right? So if we kind of I look at the evolution of technology in a, in a few different buckets in higher ed, there was, I think most of us are probably doing something in ed tech in the early 2000s when we were making things into PDFs and putting them online and kind of digitizing stuff. There's then the second phase of uh, workflow optimization, essentially. And I'm really excited about the fact that we are alive and engaged right now in this third uh, phase, which is about digital transformation. And we've really seen, uh, Matt, if we scroll down on the next visual here, that you know, COVID is going to be talked about, I'm sure, all day. But you know, we've really seen COVID accelerate transformation that has been underway or thought about for a while. So we've heard things from customers along the lines of, you know, we've been really talking about, you know, doing some hybrid or online learning for the past, you know, 10 years, um, but suddenly we're now doing it. And sometimes it's not going well, frankly, right? Some things just are not suited for this. And sometimes it is going really well. And so, but we're, we've embraced something that we've never done before, which is we're experimenting and we're open to trying things. And it's, it's a necessity right now because of where we are in a pandemic, but it's actually creating more cross-functional conversations and alignment and discussion about, okay, well, how might we, we don't wanna be in a panic for the rest of our lives about this and scrambling, but how might we actually work differently going forward so that we can be more agile, more experimental, more open to trying things versus having committees that talk about things for a long time. Similarly, in terms of the employee experience, we've had some conversations with customers who have said, uh, HR definitely said no one's working from home, no questions asked. What are they gonna, what are they doing at home? We don't know, right? Like we, that's not something we do here. Obviously we're all working from home or most of us are working from home at least uh, most of the time right now. And it's been interesting to see how that has opened up opportunities and actually conversations about collaboration and, and sharing things digitally across uh, departments to serve students. So we're really seeing, and I think it's important to note, you know, this game is changing for higher ed, but in a really good positive way that is aligning towards students, aligning towards sharing data to keep students on track, aligning toward really thinking about, you know, there's the doom and gloom headlines about admissions and enrollment and the, the shrinking, you know, opportunities here and demographics. But there is this other story, and <clears throat> it was alluded to earlier, about half of the workforce needing to be reskilled by 2022. That's a data point from World Economic Forum pre-COVID. So there's massive opportunity, but I need to get smart and I need to think about how am I gonna use data and think about, to Eric's point, my why as an institution to actually understand how does my why, my value intersect with the need in the market? And then how do I transform my business so that I can appreciate that every learner is on a different journey and may need a different kind of support. So how do I equitably support every student with what they need to be successful and appreciate that learning is gonna happen in different ways over time. Work is gonna happen in different ways forever now, right? This has changed everything for the future of work. So how do I really embrace that to actually make sure that I'm not only investing in student success. That's clearly important. No one would debate that. But I'm also appreciating and valuing that to get to student success, I must invest in faculty and staff. I'll double underline that, staff success, and making sure my staff have what they need and are engaged and inspired and motivated and connected to one another so that they can create a holistic experience for students. Matt, on the next visual, I'm gonna just, I wanna call out a one university I think is doing really great work, Indiana University. We've talked with them at Salesforce a number of times. They're a great customer. I get inspired every time I talk to them in a couple different ways. You know, they talk about how they pivoted from COVID. They talk about how they are engaging students holistically. They're engaging the community holistically to really provide different pathways for students to make sure that every student has access to a question they might have. Appreciating student might be working from home, or sorry, they might be working uh, while studying, right? So looking for an answer at two in the morning, they can get that answer. And by the way, they're not just getting an answer, they're getting actually 
the correct answer as agreed upon by the university because they're sharing information and can make sure the right answer meets the question that was posed at three in the morning by that student. And the, the thing they're doing differently that I think is important here, Brad, Brad Wheeler, CIO is, is on the slide here, but he's working with the CMO and the CFO and the president's office. And they formed this great coalition across units to say, actually, while maybe, maybe in some cases the CIO and the CFO and the CMO don't really talk to each other or they're, they, they're fighting or they actually have a lot in common and they are actually all people that need to think horizontally across business lines and they want to share data and they want to understand how do we scale this, this thing that we're trying to do, but in a way that also delivers the business units what they need and gives personalized attention to faculty, to staff, to students. And Brad and the team at IU are doing something that so many customers I think are, and so many of us are thinking about now, which is I need to stop thinking about, I'm gonna go solve this problem in, in, uh, in marketing. I'm gonna go solve this problem in admissions. And then this one in advising and this one in career services. And then this one in my one-stop solutions and then this in alumni, because I'm then creating siloed experiences, wildly disjointed experiences for one student for one student who just wants to have a seamless experience to connect to their dream, to their career. And so Indiana University, like many others, is thinking horizontally about how do I make sure that no matter what question a student has, no matter what kind of experience they're having, they can have a consistent, personalized, but consistent experience and an experience that speaks to them across touch points across IU. This is really powerful when we talk about creating a sense of belonging, when we talk about things like, you know, uh, uh, making sure students get answers at the right time, which isn't just a nice to have, but is often the difference between a student making a decision that will positively impact their future or might require them to take an extra semester or take out additional student loan funding or, or potentially drop out because they're nervous that they don't have the funding and don't understand how, what their options are. Getting the right answer to the, to the student in the right amount of time makes a huge difference. And that's what horizontal thinking across the university, uh, that's where that, that can bring us. I'm gonna land on uh, uh, one last visual here and, and happy to have discussion. I, I like to bring in customer quotes if you can't tell. And this last one, um, which is actually available on in a YouTube video from this wonderful gentleman, Tristan Denley from the University System of Georgia. Lots of YouTube videos with him giving great inspiring presentations about advising. He's a chief academic officer. Uh, I find him to be really inspirational. And a quote I actually pulled from one of his YouTube videos but that stood with, uh, uh, stayed with me is students can see that we believe in their success through the way in which we interact with them. So we've been talking about this a little bit, right? Or a lot <laughs> in terms of how we engage with students. What does the communications look like? I think it's really important to understand and appreciate the, the weight of what Tristan is saying here, which is most certainly we need to communicate with people in a personalized way and engage them very early and then connect them. Yes. But we, really need to think about this as not just a comms problem. And it's not just for technology to solve. Like there's a real role here for HR. There's a role for organizational structure. And how are we organizing ourselves to support students? Not just putting technology in place with the same way we've been doing stuff. How do we organize so that a student knows that we are there to support them and that we as staff members at the university also know amongst each other, yeah, we're organized to help here. So academic advisor, career services, you know, everyone else, all of us, our mission, our goal here is about helping that student to the finish line and making sure they have an amazing experience so they can become an engaged alumni, working in the community, engaging with us, coming back as their career changes and really having a lifelong learning engagement with us. So I hope some of that was helpful to you and inspirational. Um, we've got actually, sorry, I forgot one last thing here. We have a pretty awesome, uh, not just because we made it, I actually, I, I think it's pretty, pretty great to read. Jeff, we worked with Jeff Salingo on a pretty awesome report. Uh, it's about 30, 40 pages called the, the New You that really captures some ideas that I think will inspire thinking, honestly, about you know, what, what you could do differently. Some ideas to bring back to your institution, some ideas to think about big digital transformation, like, you know, all caps, digital transformation, transform the whole thing. But also, I think the really important things, the kind of lowercase digital transformation that's about 
creating moments that matter, high value moments that matter, that go back to that, that student at ASU at the beginning of the, of the talk here to say, we see you, we hear you, we value you, and we're gonna make sure that you feel wanted at, at our institution. Uh, Matt, thanks so much, I'll turn it back to you. At least I, I think you might be on mute, Matt. Jason, you hit exactly at the time that you were supposed to, so I appreciate that. <laughs> There is a lot of dialogue in, in the audience around some of the stuff that you're speaking to. One is from Karen, who says, you know, why does educational institutions, um, why are they not harnessing the social media platforms like other consumers do? YouTube, Instagram, when students are 24 seven. Yeah, that's, that's, that's a great question. I, I'll, I'll speak to some inspiration I've seen lately from, from some universities. I, I think it, it, you know, doing something new, exercising a new muscle can be, can be challenging. It can be, it's a little bit scary <clears throat> to think about the comments that are left or how that thing, those things have a life of their own. I think the universities who are doing that really well, I mean, I'll talk, you know, Indiana University actually just refactored their whole website around, around, around the, the, you know, the demographic and the student they're trying to attract. Schools that I think are doing that well are having real conversations around um, why it's good to give up some control and that we are not at the center. We are part of a network and we're in conversation with the customer, not the center of the conversation. So I, I think when you kind of flip that a little bit and, and embrace that you, you're going to get some bruises and stuff along the way, but also there's value in the authenticity of real conversation and people really want that right now, especially right now. Um, I think that goes a long way to foster that sense of belonging. Yeah, you know, and I think you kind of hit it. You said, this is the opportunity to pivot, right? We, I, we've been, I've been in this for 20, 30 years. You've yep. been in it for a long time. We've never seen the opportunity. We have a license to change. And in my presentation, I'll talk do. about that. We have a license to change. This is the time that leaders can lead without feeling, oh my God, I need consensus. Because we have consensus driven institutions struggle sometimes to change, yes. right? So this is the opportunity. Consensus doesn't mean don't listen to anyone else. You need to have the why, as Eric said before, so that everyone believes in what you need to do. So, you know, in your example of University of Indiana, they had a goal, they had a why, then they decided, hey, this is the strategy that we have to do it. They realized needs were changing, right? And yeah. that's an important yeah. piece of it. So. There's another question out there from Rodney Alsip. Information access on campus is more about campus uh, silos that prevent access. The data and information is available, but access yeah. is really a siloed issue. Any suggestions on eliminating the silos? I mean, this is, I mean, just so the, I mean, yes. Uh, <laughs> so this is, you know, very much, I think it's having this, a, a real conversation, kind of the come to Jesus conversation about why are we here? Like, what is the goal of this organization? And it's not about silos and maintaining those. It's about serving our students. And we do not, I, as an advisor, do not own the data. I am a steward of that data across an experience. And, you know, this conversation happens a lot because it's, you know, it's, this is not about whether technology can support appropriate levels of sharing and privacy. Like, yes, 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 that happens on a global scale with commercial companies every single day. This is about institutional willpower and creating that why and aligning individuals around success of students, not about success of their individual unit. Yeah, no, that's great. That's great. Um, there's, a, there's a question on, on getting access to your, uh, the report, the Salingo report. It is, everyone has access to the Quiller. So inside of the chat, you will see that all of our presentations are accessible to you while the presenters are there. In them, they, there are embedded links to these type of reports. So in Jason's uh, presentation, it's certainly there uh, and, and then driving it um, that way. So um, folks that are looking for it, you know, please just look on the, on the Quiller link. So uh, Jason, any last words? Words or thoughts. I'm going to actually start transitioning it to a gentleman by the name of Andy Hanna, who is really uh, changing the way that we look at data 
around students, right? You talk about the engagement element of it, but some of it is trying to understand, you know, who these students are, what your ideal, you know, student is. And we're going to go into that discussion with Andy in a second. Would love to um, transition this to David, and David's going to be the next uh, facilitator. As you guys notice, we're going to switch facilitators and moderators through the day because it's nonstop. Matt Alex can't talk the whole day. So we're going to have David, uh, you know, step in and take it from here. Jason, I appreciate the time. Um, we would love to have you back on our stage as, as we go. Any closing thoughts as we move to the next uh, guest? And no, I'll just say hello to my good friend, David. And, uh, you know, uh, Matt, uh, great, super grateful to be here today. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jason.